So I'm going to talk about um, two uh, thoughts, one long-term and top-down, uh, and the other relatively short-term and bottom-up. So first one is the long-term um, top-down, and um, there's a bit of a health warning. It does include a bit of informed speculation and a little bit of politics. And um, so uh, the proposal is a strategic pro approach to synthesis and development led archaeology over the next decade. The challenge is, it assumes there will be a change of government. Fairly high chance, I think. Um, uh, I think even if there was a hung parliament, a lot of these things might happen. Um, so if this does occur, there will almost certainly be firm targets by 2030 for 1.5 new million new houses and a new green grid. Consensus from academics and industry is that both are almost impossible to achieve. 1332 at the earliest for the green grid and house building 25, in 25 and uh, 26 is likely to be near record lows, uh, which can't really now be altered. There isn't time to change that. So the prospect, therefore, is continued acceleration in housing and green infrastructure for the next decade, certainly after um, the... Uh, yeah, so for the next, for the next decade. Um, and then uh, a planning reform bill uh, and UK industrial strategy bill will probably be in the King's speech. The second challenge is, um, uh, it's a set of challenges. Planning reform will probably include contentious changes to the Green Belt, plus making green energy development easier, learning from the Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act in the US. Um, that's... Uh, the uh, members from the, uh, the opposition uh, cabinet uh, and advisors went to see Janet Yellen, I think, um, uh, the Treasury Secretary in the US, to learn from the Inflation Reduction Act. And apparently their view was the problem they had was planning regula regulations in terms of green inf infrastructure. And so I think there's probably going to be something about that in a planning reform bill, uh, if, if and when that, that happens uh, later this year or early next year if there's a new government. Um, housing is likely to be concentrated in, in new large settlements, uh, towns controlled by statutory development corporations that assemble land banks and design the developments, including green infrastructure and transport. Uh, here I've got a few uh, pictures from Stevenage Newtown, a local new town to where I live in North Hertfordshire. Um, the first of the new towns um, was struggling really uh, by the 1990s, but there's been really turned around uh, in the past decade and a half um, by Sharon um, Taylor, um, the uh, leader of the council, and she's been headhunted by Labour Party. She's now Baroness Taylor of Stevenage and advising on um, uh, housing in the House of Lords. And um, uh, so that, that sort of shows, I think, that, that uh, the new town approach is likely to be, or picking the best of it, is likely to be part of the, uh, the strategy for planning reform. Uh, it's not going to happen in the next two or three years, but in years three, four and five, I think that um, you've got to be uh, looking to new towns being um, uh, set up or the beginnings of being set up um, throughout the south of England, but also in the north of it, the Midlands and the north as well. Um, so that's that's uh, going to be, uh, I think, an important part of development in the future. Um, the industrial strategy um, will be the first since the mid-20th century and will include investment, end-to-end -end supply chains, regulations and target setting. Uh, the green grid will include at least 700 miles of cabling and pylons uh, and is expected to be 25% government and 75% private sector funding. But uh, this is to do with the end-to-end -end uh, supply chains. The industry know that there is at least a two-year worldwide waiting list for the massive transformers required and its critical issues like the supply of copper and problems in, in the Middle East in terms of trafficking these, these huge things around that are causing delays. So I think, again, it's going to be two or three years before we see uh, much progress and also a lot of these, um, uh, you know, thoughts about the green grid and um, and planning uh, 
particularly house building in the numbers required, are going to require a lot of new people being trained, and that's going to take a few years as well. So the opportunity um, is uh, potentially a 10-year interlinked programme of archaeological assessment and investigation in advance of the green grid linked to multiple new green settlements could transform archaeological understanding, leave in additional funding, and provide a test bed for innovation. So just this again, it's a hypothetical and advocacy pitch um, to uh, government or to civil servants, or preferably to the opposition um, contacts there, um, request small changes to national planning advice, GPA2, um, that was produced, um, there's the front cover of it to the right, 10 years ago now. Um, it does need updating. I think opening it up completely for updating is probably opening a little bit of a can of worms. Um, but selective updating um, to actually put infrastructure, um, to, to, to include synthesis and the creation of narratives, including for new local communities, um, or such, you know, definitely having synthesis in, the, uh, in GPA2 and a more consistent approach to assessment, investigation, and analysis. I've also included to the uh, right, the only real uh, um, uh, policy, although this is in guidance, is in the planning practice guide, and it's, it's in, in bold is a version of the um, policy that was in PPS 5, um, which was the government, then it was a DCMS policy to improve understanding of our past. Now, by the brilliant Mike Harlow, who worked at Historic England at that time, he managed to get it into the planning practice guide, and it survived changes. It's still there, and it's it's the most it's the higher tier in terms of planning that we have to actually um, argue for synthesis. So, um, but there is an arg so there is an argument for the next level down, which is uh, GPA uh, uh, two which is a uh, historic document, but it was rubber stamped by uh, the planning department, uh, government planning department. So it has significant weight in the planning process. So any, any um, uh, words that, to, that uh, um, use, uh, you know, are useful for synthesis in GPA2 are going to be extremely helpful. So, um, uh, so having, uh, you know, a better policy, guidance, and advice framework, I think is not, you know, it's, it's achievable. And um, it just requires sort of uh, negotiation with uh, uh, planning officials and politicians. Um, it's, it shouldn't be a big deal to them because we're not asking for more money. We're not asking for anything that's, uh, that's, not, that's outside current planning uh, regulations and um, law. The second is the involved point two is the involvement of archaeology in an early stage of the procurement process. Now this is going beyond my normal um, expertise, in, uh, you know, knowledge. Um, but I think uh, to actually be able to to get involved in the level of infrastructure spending that's going to be going on, which is going to be a lot of linear developments. And if you're getting new towns, they're all going to have to be green new towns linked to the uh, green grid and um, the, the towns themselves or significant settlements, because it's not going to be towns. There are going to be a lot of housing developments in the green belt or is now being called the gray belt, um, which is the, uh, that green belt, which can be developed potentially. So um, to, to have pr procurement um, um, uh, regimes which are actually allowing uh, large bids to be assembled, um, which could enable innovation and investment. And for example, um, assessment at the bottom there, uh, which is one of the uh, assessment and evaluation, which is one of the outstanding successes of development-led archaeology looking back, um, particularly predetermination. Uh, could be taken to a new level through machine learning. I hate to say AI, AI because I, I know virtually nothing about that. But machine learning and, and predictive modeling in particular, I think there is potential uh, for joining things up um, with uh, the, the scale of development and infrastructure spending uh, uh, that's going to be happening over the next decade. And this would inform regional and national syntheses and also reduce development costs and risks. I mean, that's, that's an opinion, but I think um, 
is something that can be achieved. Other benefits could provide the critical mass in terms of scale and resources to have a strategic national or regional approach to key research aims, such as velocity archaeology, DNA, the combination of DNA stable isotope, stable isotope studies, and precision dating, which is, uh, uh, is, is revolutionising, certainly in the prehistoric period, also to develop new narratives about the past. Synthesis at national level scale, scale would facilitate links to research with colleagues across the North Sea and the Channel. And an innovative international agenda would also increase the opportunities for collaboration and funding from the academic from academic sources. To the right is a very good recent publication about um, the current state of knowledge on ancient DNA in the European Neolithic. Interestingly, it has some very good reviews of, of how the, uh, the subjects began and what's happened since. And one of the, the warning signs that it raises is different types of um, DNA analysis. Uh, apparently in Ireland, they go for full genome, but we don't in the UK. And at the moment, it's not a huge problem, but it has the potential to cause problems in the future. Um, so consistency, which is, which is a message, um, a consistent message of the uh, uh, promotion of archaeology synthesis report, I think is, is, is you know, it, for the, even for the new areas uh, that are transforming our past, they're so fast that they're not really thinking about consistency. Um, so also the proposed National Advisory Panel, which is one of the proposals within the uh, promotion of archaeological synthesis, could, could oversee the strategy and monitor progress. And if successful, all this is likely to improve, hopefully, the pay and prospects of archaeologists. So summary. We're not asking for new money, but to extract, if we go for the idea of pitching uh, something to the opposition or to a new government, preferably the former, but to extract great, greater public value from the existing planning system. Small changes to GPA2 to include synthesis and the need for consistency. Advocacy for a procurement process that would enable good synthesis, encourage investment in innovation and reduce costs and risks. A public facing role to engage new com local communities in their past and develop narratives, providing a positive joined up message for government about new development and would improve the prospects of external funding from the academic sector. And what is there to lose? Even if it doesn't initially succeed, the process of developing a strategic long-term joined-up approach will be helpful for the sector and for our, our standing with a new government as a coherent, inclusive body with a single voice that they could do business with. So that's, that's the top-down approach. Um, the bottom-up is something I'm working on with colleagues in the east of England, particularly Historic England uh, Regional Office, um, is making the case for a regional research network in the east of England. The background is really the uh, history of regional research in the east of England. The editorial board of East Anglian Archaeology Journal, the only regional journal in the country, uh, the publication series has been, it's been influential, created in 1975, nearly 50 years ago. Includes county, I've always included the county archaeologists, HE staff, uh, independent archaeologists, and has served as a discussion forum for research. Um, when I was a county archaeologist at Hertfordshire, it was the one meeting I used to enjoy going to was the EAA Regional Research, because we talked about archaeology and research and publication. And um, yeah, so, um, uh, so it was the first, well, the first region to have a regional research framework in the 1990s and the first to have a third version in 2021. The current version was produced around about 2017 to 2020, uh, was obviously uh, influenced heavily by the pandemic and went live on the AA and ADS website in 2021. Um, and the research uh, framework steering group was set up in 19, 20, 2021 to monitor progress and help with training. Next steps, uh, a rapid review of the East of England research, regional research agenda in the 2024. Again, health warning, this is something I've been working on uh, with uh, uh, colleagues uh, on the editorial board of East Anglian Archaeology, in including Historic England staff, but it hasn't quite gone live yet, um, is to have a, try and uh, uh, go through a rapid review of the East of England research agenda, not, not the um, resource assessments, but the agenda. 
um, looking at field work, publication and new discoveries since 2017. So this, which you've looked at previously, A14, A21, the, when the fantastic um, uh, internationally important uh, complex Rendlesham on the coast in Ipswich and um, looking at the impact of, in the region of archaeological science, combination of, as I mentioned before, ADNA, stable isotopes and precision dating. Uh, as, as you might I'm probably aware, there's quite a lot of uh, Anglo-Saxon cemeteries in the east of England, quite a lot of inhumation cemeteries, and uh, there's, there's an awful lot of ADNA analysis going on. And also the publication of Kingdom, Kivitas and County by Steve Rippon, which is you know, fairly unique in a way. It's a regional synthesis of the east of England from the Iron Age to the medieval and came, contains quite a lot. He did it by himself uh, in his part-time, part um, uh, but a lot of good, uh, in, uh, unique research on pottery distributions, but a lot of other distributions. And it, I think it provides a framework for looking at adding, adding sub-regional and local questions to the re regional research framework. It clearly shows that there's a divide between east and, the east and west of the region. And that divide and the transition zone, um, in terms of transitions, looking at uh, a geographical transition rather than Isabel was saying, you know, looking at a chronological one, but looking at that transition zone is, I think, going to be a sort of a, a sub-regional research priority. There are others, and I think that's something we need to raise. Uh, this review will hopefully take place in 2024, beginning with day conferences, conference at the Historical England offices in Cambridge, yet to be finally organised, but uh, we're hoping that will happen. And then we'll consult on, when that's all over, then consult on creating a virtual regional research network. So what, what the question is, what, what a regional research, uh, research network do? And this is just personal opinions, but I think it could foster collaboration for having a virtual cross-sector meeting, meetings with a dedicated research remit outside of the normal commercial uh, and curator contractor relations. We seem to achieve that, you know, in, in the East Anglian Archaeology Editorial Board, and I think that can be, you know, uh, extended to uh, more, more generally to uh, the sector and including the academic, the academic part of the sector. Then we can monitor and update references to uh, the... Uh, uh, the same, that, that, that um, network can monitor and update date references to the regional research frameworks questions by local planning authorities on OASIS with the Historic England initiative, which is very useful, uh, but we can actually, you know, uh, uh, have a more, more frequent monitorings of this, feedbacks to local authorities and the contracting organisations to actually make sure they do it. Um, develop, and then develop the knowledge and skills to produce local synthesis within the current planning system exchange information on thoughts on new discoveries, reports and articles, and create specialist networks, for instance, for osteoarchaeology, which I know the uh, science advisor is quite keen on, and uh, encourage theme presentations and discussions from guest, guest speakers. So uh, what might be the potential benefits of research networks? So uh, sharing knowledge of current excavations Research and synthesis could save significant time and resources for those engaged in their own synthesis research. Now, this, this site has been mentioned by several here. It's, uh, it's, it's nearly, um, uh, this is Marsley's Kempston and the densities of sites that were found along the Ouse Valley. It's now 13 years old and relates to excavations which took place, uh, you know, in around about the 2000, early 2000s and late 1990s. Um, but it's, it's two plans and um, the, uh, the text with it is about a thousand words. And um, so it, it's written by someone who knew and understood his landscape very well and uh, sat down, consulted a few people, got a few plans drawn up and it's had a significant contribution to uh, the understanding of archeology span in the wider region. Because when I saw this, I thought, well, we're seeing similar things in the Stall Valley in Hertfordshire. Not quite as dense as that, but comparable, you know, are we, you know, are we looking at a phenomena here, a regional phenomena? Um, so the other points, uh, sharing, uh, so yes, the, 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 going back to the point I was making, that if, if people are doing this, then um, others on a regional research network, um, once they're aware it's there, 
it's less work for them when they're writing their synthesis. Um, because if, if it's a good synthesis, someone who's looked at all the material, come up with an interesting result, it's less work for you if you're doing your synthesis and it's in the same area. Um, so I think that sort of collaboration should reduce costs, costs for synthesis. So sharing reading lists of new material and reporting back with summaries and views, same thing. Um, you know, it's collaboration. Building skills and expertise in writing synthesis. Improving the ability to raise and include relevant research priorities and synthesis at the WSI stage. This is trying to get the research issues clear before uh, tendering um, so that, you know, you don't get to the stage where the research issues come up in the, you know, updated project design stage or later and there's no money to, or you've got to pay Rob Peter to pay Paul to get the work done. Uh, and then attracting academic funding for research in the region, training and development, e.g. writing skills and workshops, and um, in the, uh, certainly uh, East Anglian archaeology is part of the regional research frameworks. In, early, in earlier phases, organised writing skills workshops, which were very, very successful. Chris Skoll, I think, ran one of them, and it um, had, had uh, a really positive impact. And grace, greater cross-sector ownership of the research frameworks, which could be reviewed and amended as appropriate. And that's the end. <laughs>